good evening yeah good evening everyone and uh, welcome back to the discussion series vartalap and uh, as you all are aware today our speaker is eminent speaker is uh, professor anita rampal so brief introduction uh, and uh, welcome uh, professor rampal just a brief introduction for those who uh, do not know her well uh, professor anita rampal was dean faculty of education delhi university and she had a nehru fellow uh, and director of national literacy resource center at the national academy of administration she was a chairperson of the ncert uh, primary textbook development teams and the nct committee for the ba curriculum she is also part of people science network bgvs the campaign for right to education and other in such initiatives um her uh, basically her areas of interest and her work is include policy studies curriculum studies education for sustainable development uh, critical mathematics education science technology society and teacher education uh, welcome professor rampal uh, to uh, engage with the discussion on mathematics education we are all eager to hear from you and learn a lot from you so over to you professor sir rampa we can take questions at the end of the session probably and if it is really something uh, urgent you can just raise your hands or put it on the chat box yeah okay yes just a minute uh, something is okay so do tell me whenever you think uh, can you hear me because you are sure. frozen yes no okay. we can hear you and yeah i'll i'll do let you know if there is some uh, kind of problems with the network or if anyone has raised their hand okay somehow my um screen has got frozen i'm just trying to okay yeah so um good evening friends and uh, i i know that uh, gomati has been trying to contact me for some time but there were too many things happening and we've just managed to meet now today i think uh, what i'll try to do is that since uh, there was this request that we should also look at the policy what is what is the new education policy saying uh, specifically about maths education the implications of that and also then try and locate that within a larger discourse so i will try to say that if we look at the policy we find that there's probably very little there's probably just one 4.25 uh it looks as if there's very little that is being said but i'll open it up a little to say that uh it may be just uh, you know one line but it's trying to say much more which we need to be wary of and to take cognizance of um if people would also like the, uh, me to speak bilingually i'll do that so you can let me know um you know hindi mein bhi bolu to shayad kuch suvidha rahe पर मुझे बता दीजिए कि हिंदी में दोनों भाषाओं में बोलना सही है या केवल एक में तो पॉलिसी में क्या लिखा है इस मैथ्स को लेके दैट मैथमेटिकल थिंकिंग एंड कॉम्प्यूटेशनल थिंकिंग विल बी गिवन इंक्रीज्ड एम्फेसिस थ्रू आउट द स्कूल इयर्स स्टार्टिंग विद द फाउंडेशनल स्टेज थ्रू इनोवेटिव मैथ बेसिकली ये मेन चीज है जो मैथमेटिक्स के बारे में लिखी है उसके बाद ऐसे ही है थ्रू इनोवेटिव मेथड पजल्स एंड गेम दैट मेक मैथमेटिकल थिंकिंग मोर इंजॉयबल एंड आई वॉन्ट टू से इस तरह की चीजें जहां भी पॉलिसी में लिखी है बल्कि पॉलिसी में जब भी पेडेगोजी के बारे में लिखा है तो उसमें बहुत कम समझ दिखती है पॉलिसी की पेडेगोजी को लेकर वॉट एवर वेन एवर एनी थिंग इज बींग रिटन अबाउट अ पेडेगोजिकल अप्रोच it's a very there's a very uh, poor understanding or hardly you know, any understanding of pedagogy so that's why it resorts to words like fun fun based uh, activity based puzzles and games you know i mean it's just that kind of a very superficial level at which it's talking about pedagogy whether it's talking about language or science or you know learning in anything else so um so that is what and there's one more line which says activities involving coding will be introduced in the middle years that's all so what seems to be like a very nominal uh, notion of mathematics in the policy it says mathematics and computational thinking will be given uh, increased emphasis i was quite interested to note 
that in 2019, when I was part of, uh, you know, as part of international uh, executive committee of mathematics uh, of, uh, education, I had written something and raised concerns. I had raised concerns about international large scale assessments uh, at at least two of the organizations where I was in the executive committee. And I had written something which I just want to bring to your notice that us samay bhi policy se pehle bhi ek jo mujhe chinta thi ganit shikshan ko lekar wo ye thi. In, I had written that, uh, you know, there is a changed format for the program of international student assessment, PISA. Or agar aap log isse parichit nahi hai, to thoda iske baare mein padhiye, kyunki ye abhi tak humne uh, is tarhe ke testing ko uh, resist kiya hai. We have not uh, entered into this, we means India. And when in 2009, there were pressures on India to actually take part in the PISA test. Many of us who were involved with the ministry or with the NCF or with the right to education, and we were close uh, in terms of policy making, we had actually opposed this. And the ministry had then taken this position that when it is asking and it is saying that we are nowhere near the quality of teaching and learning, and that's why an RTE has been brought in with the singular purpose of trying to make education more inclusive, more equitous and better quality with teachers also who are better trained and a learning environment that the RTE says very clearly in its chapter five. And I would request everyone to read that before we start talking about policies. So uh, we had said that, uh, uh, so the ministry had said we will not enter any international testing because we're not even uh, we've not even taken the responsibility of providing a good uh, um, environment for better learning. So how can we just jump into something which is then going to derail us? You know, that was the kind of understanding. And, uh, uh, but, humne, to humne jab dekha ki, uh, 2021 ke liye, mathematics, every three years, one subject area becomes the focus of this international test. And PISA right now, is a test which is governing educational curricula all over the world. It's really pushing countries. And I'll take a little example of some other countries where I have personally been invited to look at their curriculum because they've been pushed into changing everything suddenly because of their poor rank in PISA. But PISA 21 was supposed to be with a focus on mathematics again. And uh, uh, you know, every three years there's a cycle. And so I was looking at these policy papers and I had seen that there's going to be a major shift in the way mathematics is looked at. So I was writing that the focus of this shift in mathematics teaching was going to be on to include computational thinking, which is systems thinking, algorithmic thinking, modeling, simulation, et cetera, as part of mathematical reasoning. And there was this kind of, debate that was required that when we talk of mathematic reasoning and especially at the elementary school level, does it mean that we are also assuming that computational reasoning is a part of mathematical reasoning? So, uh, and I had said that the OECD survey, uh, OECD, in fact, uh, you know what the OECD countries are, mostly the countries of the North, developed countries, uh, and it was the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, more than cooperation, now we are seeing how it's pushing for competition through education. And education in the very, very conservative uh, way of looking at social capital, the most sort of problematic notions of how education has to be linked to economic productivity. Very different from the humanist traditions, international humanist traditions, even of UNESCO before, uh, uh, say, 2005, 2010, UNESCO was taking a very strong position, which was almost like Paolo Freire's position, where you said that education, really, you can't put the responsibility on a person, uh, but it is how does education give you that transformative potential to actually change things, you know, change things, organize yourself, change things so that development is something that all communities can participate in. 
And whereas now, if you look at all the countries and the way they look at their policies, the way they frame the aims of education, including our own NEP 2020, the aim does not talk about transformative education or people's ability to question, interrogate, and transform their lives. In fact, it talks about fitting into, you know, it says everyone should be able to fit into the fast changing scenario. So uh, it's the fitting in that is being called for in most countries. And OECD was looking at, shockingly, it did a survey of global employment and industry of OECD countries. And it said that uh, the requirements of this changing industry would be that mathematics of complex systems, statistics, probability, and algorithmic thinking above and beyond the traditional uh, mathematics of arithmetic, geometry, algebra, et cetera, will need to be taught at school level, at elementary school level also. And uh, curiously, when they did a survey of people, uh, you know, and they talked about surveyors or even talked about woodworkers, you know, tarkhan hai jo, carpenters hai, jis tarhe ka kaam kar rahe hai, they said that now they don't need much trigonometry. Now they only need data. In fact, there were some studies that they saw that the waiters in the restaurant have to learn about the arithmetic or the mathematics. So they said that they don't have to learn about it. They don't have to do much competition. They take orders on the tablet and everything is computed on the tablet. They don't really need that. So timetables, these are railway timetables. These are people don't need rail, to look at railway timetables now. You know, you get this information all processed straight on the internet. And so these were the kinds of reasoning that were used because importantly, PISA claims to be talking about real life mathematical literacy. You know, the word is literacy. They don't even say, they say, hum curriculum se kuch hamara lena dena nahi hai. Hum to zindagi mein kis tarhe ki, uh, kis tarhe ki ganit ki zarurat padegi. Usko hum dekhte hai, isle hum usko test karte hai. And that's why they don't try and say, okay, we are looking at any country curriculum, which in fact they are, they have been pushing for it. How they push it for it is because they do rankings. They do testing. Now they've got a huge number of non-OECD countries coming in and they also have a PISA for development. So they realized, so in 2009, India ko very manipulative way say, uh, force kiya tha, you know, India ka participation. So what they did was the World Bank and DFID, the British aid agency, hai, they actually uh, uh, took Himachal Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, two states. They funded their participation because funding, uh, a lot of funding is required for any country to participate in this. And I know that more than from our country, I know it from Indonesia which had actually invited me in 2016, 17, to look at their curriculum, which they said had been changed very rushed, in a very rushed manner in 2013 because of the pressures of PISA. And when I met them and they were very open uh, because they realized that we have similar concerns. They had seen our textbooks, they had seen our NCRT primary textbooks. And, uh, so, and they wanted me to look at maths and science. But they said they were surrounded. So look at the politics of being surrounded. So a country like Indonesia is surrounded by these very high performing countries. You know, uh, so they said in, in Australia and Singapore and all these countries seem to be influencing and they come and they tell our ministries that we will take a bid, of course, for payments, but we will try and help you change your curriculum. So, but the question was that we, when we looked at uh, even a country like Indonesia, uh, when they changed their curriculum, I was shocked. I was shocked because their class seven mathematics textbook was 700 pages. It was just full of information. It was intimidating in the most traditional manner. It was full of information formally and, you know, all kinds of diagrams. And uh, even when it said it is taking a real life context, it was very contrived. I mean, I have written this in a report and I recently noticed that I've actually published that report. Uh, so, uh, you know, they had, they called someone a farmer, but this farmer had a tie. And then we, we suddenly realized that actually the person was posing as he may have been a very rich farmer, but he was actually the author of the textbook. And so, you know, it was all, there were some women with children and selling apples. And that was a, 
photograph taken straight from the internet from a European context. So, you know, this is what happens when we think that culture or location or context doesn't play a role and we get completely sucked into this regime of testing, which our new policy is very strongly now coming in with. You know that there is a national testing agency. It is clearly saying that now this testing agency will be telling what the state should be doing. In fact, in the entire curriculum development, you must be knowing what's happening. There's 170 page guidelines, which has gone to the states, even while they're being they're supposedly writing their state curriculum framework. And these guidelines are completely sort of really imposing on states what they should be doing. So I'm just saying that the centralizing agenda of the, of the policy is going to be, is a matter of great concern. And one has written about this, just as the consolidation agenda, which says that uh, small schools are not optimal, close them down. So in Orissa, 10,000 schools were closed down. In another, more so the tribal areas closed down schools because they say uh, very low enrollment. So they have, uh, many of us who worked on the right to education and legal experts have questioned because this policy actually contradicts the right to education. It contradicts a fundamental right, which a policy cannot be doing. So, uh, and one of the most damaging statements it makes is that uh, inputs will not be focused on. There will be not much focus on inputs. And so I just want to start with saying neoliberal uh, uh, learning outcomes havi ho jate hai. Uh, our ministry when it passed the RTE had given a note saying that if a child is failing, it is not the child, it is we who are failing because we have not been able to provide an environment for good education, equitable education. But now it's just the opposite. The onus is on the child, on the learner, on the parent. And this is what we are finding uh, across countries. Very recently, I was reading something in what is happening in Latin American countries uh, under these kinds of shifts and changes. And uh, Chile is an example that is taken, you know, because they started the neoliberal policies during the dictatorship, during the military regime. So these are the kinds of concerns which are a matter of, you know, which need much more understanding when we look at curriculum. Also, because India has already pledged that it is entering PISA. It, had, it was supposed to do in 21, obviously because of COVID, it, didn't, uh, it was not done. It will do soon whenever next PISA is held. And uh, though India, uh, so like China, has chosen what it wants to enter, and it is very, very, very carefully and, and cleverly, I must say, entering only Chandigarh. So only Chandigarh as a small union territory directly under the center and also in a very selective manner, you know, so that is the, those are the schools which India is entering, like China had done for Shanghai the first time, and China continues to do it. It enters only four uh, of such uh, um, uh, districts, provinces, but China last time in the PISA completely overwhelmed everyone because they, they all of them, these, uh, their four provinces were performing way above. And I want to tell you one thing before I go into our own curriculum and our challenges. Uh, what internationally is considered as the lowest level. In fact, uh, they say that those who can't even attain level one and level one proficiency at level one is supposed to be uh, direct instructions for a question that you've given, familiar context, information which is all provided for routine procedures. This is what the proficiency at level one in mathematics is supposed to be. And uh, I would just like you to think that when India, two of India's best states, best in terms of the provisions, Himachal and Tamil Nadu were just after Kerala in terms of provisioning schools and teachers for everyone, you know? And in 2009, they came second last. Uh, so, we can see what this kind of testing does. It creates, I call it manufacturing of a crisis. So it manufactures a crisis 
And then we know that, uh, you know, even a country like Germany goes through a PISA shock or some other country goes through a shock. And just two days back, the person from Indonesia was contacting me uh, because they have changed their textbooks now and he wanted me to help him look at look through them uh, and to see whether what is it that we are seeing because what I noticed was that in Indonesia, a country with the similar with similar disparities, similar diversities like us, different languages, different uh, communities in different islands, poverty the way we have, when they were going through, uh, when they had changed their curriculum almost within two months, which is overnight, curricula should take 10 years or you know longer engagement to change. What they had seen was that they, uh, I had seen was in their schools that they, all their exams, even the school exams were multiple choice. So their class four mathematics exam was multiple choice. Their science exam was multiple choice. Their language exam was multiple choice. How does anyone start learning language or expression or thinking or understanding with only multiple choice because their national test was going to be multiple choice and then PISA. So any large scale assessment falls down within very restrictive constrained ways of assessing something. And that becomes the biggest hurdle for a teaching learning process. So I think as teachers, teachers, as teacher educators, our biggest challenge is to this assessment. To do it from a centralized assessment, we do not give our children to do it, because it is our classroom to finish our classroom. And that is what I saw. Ki multiple choice, because then they are easier to uh, as you know, uh, assess and easier to evaluate. But I want you to just note that in the last PISA mathematics assessment, there are 26 countries out of 79, which took that test in 2018, which have one fourth to half of their students who have not even achieved level one. So what are we talking about? You know, it's worrying because especially in mathematics, I mean, other things, at least they see that there can be ways of looking at how uh, children are learning. And these questions, so the proficiency six, which the top countries manage to do and, you know, uh, are very challenging, are something that, you know, yes, we would like our students to be able to do that kind of conceptualization, that kind of applications and understanding, but they haven't been able to reach even level one. And even uh, countries like Korea, which are performing very well, almost near the top, Germany, their children, 15% of students are below level two. So what is this telling us about mathematics, about how mathematics needs to be taught and looked at, how mathematics for equity, you can't leave out some people, because in our country, we know one of the biggest, biggest uh, sort of challenges even today is that teachers and textbook writers and everyone, parents, everyone thinks that for mathematics, you need a special talent. And even adults all around us, you know, so mathematics becomes this kind of myth that it is only for some people. You need some talent for it. And people very proudly say, I'm sorry, I just can't do mathematics. I look at numbers and I get a stomachache which is true. I mean, people get physical symptoms of anxiety and they're not making it up. It's true. And that is what we have to look at. Why is it that the world over uh, mathematics can become such a disabling area of learning? And so the challenge on us is even greater. How do we look at mathematics learning? And secondly, mathematics becomes a gatekeeper. Aap kisi bhi entrance exam mein jana chahenge you know, uh, even if it's for work uh, situations or higher education, something which comes under aptitude testing has a lot of mathematics requirements, not just in our country, in every country. I mean, wahan kisi ko carpenter bhi banna hai, to uska jo entrance test level license lene ke liye test hota hai, usme bhi bohat ganit ki apeksha hai, ki this is the kind of maths that a person should know. To hum isko gatekeeper bulate hai. कि ये बंद कर देता है दरवाजे कुछ और तरह के काम में भी 
आप जिसको ऑक्यूपेशनल काम कुछ करना चाहते हैं आप कोई और काम करना चाहते हैं आप फिल्म स्टूडियो और फिल्म मेकिंग में काम करना चाहते हैं वहां भी जिस तरह के टेस्ट होते हैं वो एक गेट कीपर मैथ्स जो है जिस तरह से मैथ्स वहां सामने आता है और इंडोनेशिया में भी हमने देखा कि जो उनका वोकेशनल एजुकेशन का कोर्स है टेंथ के बाद टेंथ लेवल के बाद उसका मैथमेटिक्स की किताब बिल्कुल वो ही है जो कि स्टैंडर्ड रेगुलर स्कूल मैथमेटिक्स की है क्यों क्योंकि वो कहते हैं नहीं हम इसमें फर्क नहीं करना चाहते पर इट हैज नो रेलिवेंस टू व्हाट द स्टूडेंट्स आर डूइंग व्हाट द स्टूडेंट्स विल बी डूइंग इफ दे आर वर्किंग इन टूरिज्म और दे आर वर्किंग इन समथिंग एल्स दे हैव गॉट हंड्रेड पेजेस ऑन मेट्रिसीज इन देयर बुक हंड्रेड पेजेस जस्ट ऑन मेट्रिसीज हंड्रेड पेजेस ऑन इंटीग्रल फंक्शन सो यू नो नो वन questions the relevance of how you develop a curriculum and that's why i was questioning this when i say form life and for life and this in fact comes from the nai taleem nai taleem ka jo motto tha wo tha education from life for life and hamare liye bhi agar hum shiksha ko is tarah dekhte hain aur hum ye alag nahi karna chahte ki skills जो क्षमताएं हैं वो तो हाथ की हाथ से काम करने की क्षमताएं सिर्फ कुछ लोगों में है जो जिनमें अबिलिटी कम है वन एवर वी से अबिलिटी इवन इन डेली गवर्नमेंट स्कूल्स इट्स शॉकिंग इन क्ला इन सॉरी इन इन क्लास थ्री द टेस्ट दैट इज डन फॉर अ चिल्ड्रन इन डेली गवर्नमेंट स्कूल्स लुक्स एट देयर अबिलिटी इन डिविजन or something like that something which you would know is is a very challenging area the way we do there is a lot of noise coming someone's mic needs to be muted i need to uh yeah man you so, can continue yeah okay there are still sounds coming so uh, so i'm just saying that even in the name of in in a, in the name of trying to see what children are learning and testing them in class 3 or class 6 giving them a different label delhi government is doing that it's segregating them physically it's segregating giving them a differentiated curriculum so what mathematics the talented students do in class 6 the committed students nishtha students do not do that mathematics and the exam paper is different so this kind of track streaming completely in a public system it's a public school aur usme alag sections bitha diye unke mathematics ke papers bhi alag hote hain ki unko ye padhne ki zarurat nahi hai so that kind of segregating them and then pushing them into the open school i know thousands of students who have been pushed out of the regular government school in delhi uh, in delhi into the open school system often because they didn't have a maths teacher in their class 8 or class 9 or class 10 you know so why are they pushed out because they say their results should not actually make should not taint our class 10 board exam results hum dikhana chahte ki hum bahut acha kar rahe hain to inke kam number jo aa rahe hain ya fail ho rahe hain hum usse apne board results ko kharab nahi hone denge dhakka lagao bahar nikalo so this kind of segregation of children aur ye policy mein bhi spasht humko dikh raha hai ki aap skills ke naam pe you say vocational education should start early but we must remember the status to vocational education please look at the syllabi of vocational education they are very there's no education in that it's only skills defined by industries education is zero so pushing out people under the name of ability we must also remember then what is the responsibility of the way this testing is done and what kind of maths whether it comes in the name of aptitude testing or it comes even for civil service examinations what kind of maths comes there now having laid out the major challenge before us i just want to take uh, a couple of examples which you may be familiar with to say that what is it that we tried in ncert some of you may be familiar with these books some of you may be teaching with these i don't know and uh, can i just screen share for 5 minutes 
or maybe before doing that, can uh, should we have some discussion? If there is any observation or or comment that uh, you know people would like to make. Yeah, sure, we can have that. Uh, participants, yeah. you can either raise your hands or unmute yourself. Yes, uh, Nidhi wants to ask something or comment, please. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, hello, ma'am. Uh, so um, it's, it was a pleasure, pleasure hearing you. So uh, while you were talking, I was remembering how I was taught mathematics. So uh, we used to do multiplications. I learned tables at a very early age, but I didn't know the logic behind tables. So I learned table till 20, but um, learning the logic behind multiplication and table, it happened incidentally when I was in ninth and 10th grade. It did not happen intentionally. No one taught us intentionally that, okay, this is uh, the logic behind mathematics and this is the principle or means, uh, this is the theory that means there is the implicit thing that should be learned first. It comes incidentally and accidentally to many people. Then they grow to start loving mathematics. But uh, earlier there was a very, very much anxiety. So yeah, thank you for talking about that. That's true. And in fact, uh, you know, even when we work, I mean, my own students and we have worked with teachers and what are the kinds of teachers beliefs about mathematics? Who do the teachers think are good learners and who do, what do they expect from good learners? There is an entire belief system around that. You know, there's a belief system that mathematics has to be done fast. Those who come up with the answer quick and come to the correct answer are the good learners. Now, these are myths. These are not really uh, characteristics of good learners or they don't lead to good learning. So uh, I'm just sort of raising some of these issues. Obviously, we can't go into the detail of these things, but these are all areas of mathematics research now. Mathematics education research is looking at the identities that we form through mathematics by telling someone, oh, how smart, and by telling someone, too bad, you don't have it in you, you know, you, how do we form these identities? What do they mean for children's participation, not just in school, but even later? And that is a big issue about justice, about, you know, are we really entitled to be making these kinds of labeling, whether implicit or explicit uh, on, on a child and then telling them that you're no good in something and also then telling them that you're not smart enough to be doing this, you know, so these kinds of things or, for instance, like you said, that you struggle with it yourself. You're never given that chance because uh, you're always told that your answer is wrong. You know, that's all. At the most, a teacher might give you some steps, but teachers themselves are part of a system which doesn't understand how really mathematics should be taught. And uh, recently we were discussing something which was very interesting that, you know, Cuba was known for its children performing so well, but what was important was that it was a virtuous cycle. I mean, they interestingly took a, a syllabus from GDR, from, you know, East Europe, East Germany, and then they adopted it some years back. But the way they, their children got, uh, you know, it was like a cycle because their teachers at the secondary level knew such good mathematics because the focus was on concepts. If even their textbooks had much less than the textbooks of Brazil or Chile in the same region, but they had less, but they really understood it deeply. And there was a focus on child-centered approaches. There was a focus on doing it through work. They found that, uh, that they could do so much more demanding mathematics, even at the secondary level. And then these people, when they became teachers, obviously the curriculum could be much more demanding because teachers could handle it. So, you know, to have children learning good mathematics means that you really need a virtuous cycle, a cycle within your system, which creates good teachers, which provides good uh, mathematics right up to the secondary level, because that counts when you become a teacher. And then how does your curriculum uh, get a shape so that teachers understand what learning is all about, not just in getting one right answer, you know, or not just saying, sorry, you're taking too long to do this. So I'm saying that even within one region, we can see there is so much difference in the way children perform or so much difference in the way textbooks and curricula are made. And especially on assessment, 
Cuba has never gone, even till today, has not entered international assessments. So, you know, I'm just tying these things up that why is assessment so important? Because it pushes you in terms of the curriculum that you should be doing. And it pushes teachers, you know, because the blame then comes on them, either on the child or on them. Yeah. Any other observation? Yeah, there is one more, Dr. Kaushal. Yeah. 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 Very nice uh, discussion and a very new face of NEP is coming out, ma'am. I just wanted to uh, share something that, you know, when we are all the time focusing on curriculum, don't you think that the pedagogy is also that important? Because textbooks and everything keeps on changing and updating. But ultimately, it is the teacher who takes it to the classroom while they're teaching. As I am from the teacher education field, so... Uh, being a teacher educator, what can be my input that I can train the prospective teachers in this direction, please? I want to clarify when I say curriculum, it includes pedagogy, it includes assessment, it includes everything. Curriculum is the broad umbrella under which we talk. Curriculum is not syllabus. So curriculum includes like the curriculum framework that we talk about in yes. CF. So curriculum is a word which includes everything. Assessment is an important part of the curriculum. Pedagogy, of course, is an important part. And that's why I was giving this last example, say, of a country, Cuba, where because they have invested in a curriculum, which means everything, not just what you put as topics or competencies or whatever yeah. it is, yeah. how you do it. They were influenced by Vygotsky. They were influenced by Makarenko at the time when they were framing this uh, uh, their understanding of how uh, uh, mathematics, uh, how, how the school curriculum should be shaped. And uh, so I'm saying the depth in which concepts are understood right from the beginning, obviously it means, that's what I was trying to say, that the teachers have been through the same kind of teaching, learning, the same kind of learning. And when they become teachers, there's a lot of focus on how they will be teaching. So their internship, their teacher pre-service training, everything is focusing on understanding learning processes. So what should teaching learning? Not just saying, I delivered a lesson plan. That's meaningless. No. How can yeah. you deliver something? Uh -huh. You know, In my own BA department, so my students would say, teachers would say, we delivered 20 plans. It's not a delivery system. So what is the transactional uh, uh, role in that? How does teaching learning happen, not only by an individual student, but as a social process? How does the mathematics of everyday life come in and should come into the curriculum? If it does not, then it's a very, very jaundiced, very, very you know, distant curriculum, which is not ready from life. So all these things, unless they are part of that, and even for instance, when I spoke to people in Finland, because they again are said to be performing very well, but when I was lucky when they invited me there to talk on policy, I met people who had who retired from the faculty, but they were part of the curriculum development in the 80s. And they said it takes 10, 15 years. It's not something that you do in one year or two years, you know, that kind of understanding and that kind of convincing and acceptance by teacher educators, by teachers. So what do we mean by learning? Uh, which is a social process. What do we mean by constructivist learning? It's not just repeating a term and you know everyone will understand it. That, and, and she said that for them, the biggest challenge was by that time, by when, when she was in school and later, it was assumed that a rural child needs a different kind of learning and the urban child would have a different curriculum. So she was saying, just bridging that and saying that we have to have the same kind of teaching and learning, and there has to be an equity between rural and urban. She said that was very difficult to convince teachers because even teachers start thinking that, you know, mm -hmm. that child just needs to do farming. So why should I? So I'm saying that equity, which they worked on, is a long, is a deep process, which we have to understand. In mathematics, I'm underlining is because it's the major process that happens. We tend to assume that not everyone can do this. So why bother? And this policy, when it talks about the foundational stage for liter literacy and numeracy is very damaging because it is saying that up to age eight, 
we are just going to be doing minimal you know so it's a very minimalist program when you try and dumb down something and you say that i'm going to only focus on this you know that the private school is not going to do that the private schools don't even look at the ncert or the cbse curriculum they push down so much which is mm-hmm. unnecessary but they think that their level is high so right. they push that down but this policy is dumbing down for the children for that because a child doesn't have to do only literacy and numeracy a child has to do mathematics science mm-hmm. uh, many other things you know in an integrated way a child has a lot of understanding of social processes around her in an integrated way you know and that we will be totally damaging that if we just start focusing on minimal fa- uh, literacy foundational literacy or numeracy so this terminology comes from a very neoliberal position internationally you know when we in the start talking because this comes at well for the majority of the poor this is what you need to focus on so your public system becomes mostly for the poor and then you say anyone else can pay for it and do something more you know and for countries like us from the south this is what this is what i was saying that even though these international tests assume that they are trying to bring in uh, uh, mathematics for life for everyone but 26 countries are telling us that half their children don't even achieve level 1 level 1 of mathematics so what are we doing how are we making the curriculum and how are we transacting it and how are we testing it most important and testing if we do it through a culturally responsive way one of my students has done her phd on that we we saw that in a school with the children in class 8 even those who may be failing very badly even those who may be getting 30 out of 100 or something like that when they come and start doing assessment tasks not just these items which have no meaning for them any question which just has no meaning has no purpose for a child why should a child divide something or multiply something or why so there is a why with the assessment also why should the child do it so when there is a task for which has a purpose for the learner the child knows why i'm doing this is the purpose for me to do this the child learns in the process of assessment we did no teaching we only did assessment tasks and we found children from each other children from something they had learned earlier children learned so much more in terms of data handling which they didn't know in their regular classroom and they could have been failing there but they were learning here just through different formats of assessment so that's why assessment i am underlining as a very critical part of the curriculum yeah and the obviously the pedagogy yeah thank you Yeah, ma'am. That's one more hand raised, Dr. Ruchi Kumar from TIS. Yeah. Hi, uh, Dr. Anita. It was really a pleasure Hi. to listen to you. Hi, Ruchi. Yeah. Good yeah. To see you. Hi. Good to see you too. Uh, so, uh, I one of my student is working on the you know the alignment between the intended curriculum that is there in the Uh, curriculum documents the textbook uh, the enacted curriculum which the teacher enacts in the classroom and the assessed curriculum and what is there in the uh, you know the tests uh, that are there uh, at the at the school level or at the tests which are given by the teachers itself and uh, it has been very interesting to see that you know the teachers and we also know from our previous research that teachers seem to align uh their pedagogy more to the uh, towards the assessment uh, the kind of assessment that has been externally imposed uh, rather than the assessment that they themselves uh, you know might create to assess uh, students learning so to what extent uh, do you think it is important for us to develop uh, teachers uh, capability to design authentic assessments um, in order to uh you know even uh, uh, bring out the depth in their pedagogy itself to Absolutely. allow or to empower them to learn from their uh, pedagogy yeah uh, absolutely and that's why i don't even separate these terms of intended and enacted because they're all connected you know i can't even separate them like i can't separate formative from summative assessment i don't think we need to when you say authentic assessment 
that's a part of the pedagogy. That's part of the teaching learning process. Whether I do it at one point or I do it at the end of the term, they, they cannot be because, you know, teachers, I recently we had a, a workshop in SCRT, which was saying, how do we look at holistic assessment as the policy is telling us to prepare a holistic uh, report card. And we had some teachers, experienced teachers from some, you know, elite schools who say they spend a lot of time on assessment, but even they are caught up with words like diagnostic testing. We do the, and then I ask them why diagnostic? The word itself is so, so terrible. You know, I mean, you're diagnosing a, an illness in someone and then you're doing a remedy. Why do we need these terminologies? So I totally sort of, I would like to underline this, that we need to get away from these initial, these terminologies, which come from a very different behavioral understanding of the learner, the teacher, the teaching learning process, etc. And if we do that, then we authentic assessment is a part of learning is a part of the entire teaching and learning process. And um, uh, unfortunately, in our systems, there is hardly any meta learning that happens in a child. I mean, I've seen in other country children, young children, seven year old, can tell me that, you know, in mathematics, I can do this, but I cannot do this too well. And to do this, I need to do this, you know, I mean, this kind of meta level of a child's own understanding of what she is doing and how she is performing mathematics, we don't have it till our in the entire school system. A student has to go to the teacher to say, "Madam, madam, madam, ye right hai, ye wrong hai, good hai, bad hai." You know, because hum kahi wo develop hi nahi karte. So assessment and self-assessment and a meta level understanding of what learning means. What do I need to do better? How? I mean, a child never knows, you know, and that has to come. That's why the, uh, even the tasks that we do and the tasks that we were doing uh, with these children, even though we were not doing teaching, uh, but uh, we were trying to speak and they were choosing some of these tasks. You know, when a certain discussion arose, they said, OK, we'll do this. We'll try and see that the construction laborers are in the men or women, kitna difference wages they are giving. Or ye dono tino contractors kitna de. So encourage them to take uh, charge of what is it they want to do. They want to do some data uh, analysis there. Let them choose that. Like, for instance, I'll tell you, I thought that was the most rewarding part of this research that class eight children formed a voluntary group. And they said, uh, we said that we want to keep the record of the midday meal of this school and you will do it. I mean, look at the sense of responsibility on these class eight children, many of them who were told you're no good. And they then decided how are they going to do it? Sometimes they faltered, they went wrong. They tried to follow kitne bachche khane ko gaye, and then they'd say, God, we can't keep track. Kitne aa rahe hai. Then they learned something, ke tally karte the hum, let's do a tally. And eventually when they actually kept the records of the midday meal for the school, the sense of agency, the sense of responsibility, they actually came and told us and told the principal, ke ma'am, kuch ghapla hai, kyunki we have seen the site, jahan se ye midday meal aata hai, wo site keh raha hai ke 900 meals are sent every day. We have been keeping a record over these past few weeks. We get only a hundred meals because only a hundred children eat. Others bring, others ko teachers discourage karte tumhare maa baap aise ki tumhye khana tak nahi de sakte hum. That's the way the teachers were uh, telling the children. So they are telling the principal that there is some mismatch. The agency says they send us 900. They don't. So I'm saying that the purpose, the purpose behind assessment, if it has meaning for children, uh, you find that their motivation, their interest, their ability to get a meta level of their own abilities, you know, kya karna hai, kya isme, uh, hame, uh, what are the strategies, what are the competencies expected? So if, if that happens, I think that is a major step in our country. In our country, assessment has been the weakest link. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that very elaborate uh explanation to all the questions. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah, maybe we can take it towards the end again. Ma'am, 
wish to continue? I'll quickly, actually, since we've taken up most of our time, I'll just take yeah. one or two examples just to show you that. I mean, or, or can I, uh, Gomati, can I assume that everyone is familiar with the NCRT textbooks or no? Should I? Uh, can, we have, can we have a hand raise as to how many of you are familiar with the NCRT textbook? Primary textbooks. <clears throat> yeah. Majority of them seem to, ma'am. Say, okay. For okay. Exception. A few so exceptions. What I'll do is I'll just take one page and just talk uh, around, you know, one uh, example. Sure. Just as a, just as a, token example, I will just take this, you know, one chapter to say, uh, why were we uh, thinking in terms of thematic chapters? Uh, can you see this? This is a chapter called Building with Bricks. Uh, there are other thematic chapters, like there's something on Bhim Betka, the cave paintings. There's something on time, the notion of time. Again, I've written about this also that, you know, in all, mathematics textbooks across the world, you find that the teaching of time is only about reading clocks and calendars, nothing else. Why? So uh, there also how we try to look at what time means for a child from her everyday life, from her context, and develop more in terms of a sense of time. Do, do children, can they understand what things happen in seconds and what things happen in a minute? Or what are the kinds of processes that take hours rather than just giving them that one minute has 60 seconds, which is a trivial information that is given. So, uh, uh, you know, so this is what we mean by, what I mean by trying to look at uh, mathematics from life and then for life. So I'm just taking one example. Uh, in this textbook, in the class three textbook, we didn't, this was the first time we were talking about anything like a rectangular, like a cuboid, we've never used these terms. I don't think we need to use these terms. It's, it's uh, because the more terms that we use, which are very unfamiliar, which are not really part of uh, the child's everyday uh, experience, they tend to then become another burden. You know, there's a term that has been used. Our policy was to avoid the term unless absolutely necessary because now that concept is understood and we need a term that can differentiate that concept from another concept. So a very, very careful, judicious understanding of when some new term is required. The concept can come in many ways, but the term needn't come. Uh, like we, we've been doing that, you know, always in our teaching. We, don't, we did a whole chapter without talking about gravity or gravitation. So I think you don't need a term, but how do you, uh, without even explicitly asking a child, there's an implicit understanding. We must have space for implicit understanding. The concept in science on uh, air pressure is a very, very difficult and uh, or even condensation, very abstract concepts. So don't jump on a term, but just say whether very implicitly, I may not be able to say what I understand, but are you helping me make this become, use this concept and try and think about it? So I'm saying that is important in any teaching and learning, which is contextual and which is focusing on children's ways of thinking. So here, this was just a chapter on building with bricks because it was also an idea that, you know, there is so much more to building with bricks than just trying to look at, uh, you know, notions of a cuboid or uh, things. In fact, the idea of heritage, and this was, this is a true story. It's not just made up. It was true that we went to this mosque which is a 300 year old mosque. And uh, the people who had built this there, you know, I mean, the people who are Masons today, their ancestors had built it. So uh, these Masons were the people who were actually making a school building over there, uh, a school which is, a, a, which is actually a private school, but it's a school which came out of an initial school on the railway station of children out of school. So it's for disadvantaged children, but this uh, had to shift because they were thrown out of the railway station 
and then eventually they had some family land so the person went here to make the school and in the school the architect was working with local masons and saying what is their knowledge what is the local knowledge of these masons and was asking them that if we want to make a courtyard of the school let's make some brick patterns and uh, they couldn't think too much because nowadays they said no one asked them to make any brick patterns you know so they don't have this kind of knowledge of how you do it so the architect took them there and i went later and i was amazed by this mosque because in this courtyard that you can see there were 2000 brick patterns it's a you know it's a courtyard of this and there were 2000 brick patterns and these photographs i have taken so uh, you know these photographs we took and the masons went there they they had seen these brick patterns they had come back and then they all had made their own brick patterns and this is what it is what they had made so we are using that real life experience of understanding local and indigenous knowledge and then coming back into the and and making a whole chapter around that which is a true story and so you can see the children sitting on the on the finished uh, courtyard this is the when the when they came back and they started making brick patterns and then through this we are looking at symmetric patterns what is a you know what is a line of symmetry so all these things are part of mathematics so we're trying to do that and uh, which pattern is in a circle draw a line do you see mirror halves etc etc so there's much which is important in symmetries which traditional mathematics textbooks think that this is just some play or games or something so there's another way of trivializing creative ways of doing mathematics creative areas of mathematics because we assume that they have nothing to do with numbers so or they have nothing to do with the um, angles or shapes and shapes also we never look at irregular shapes we straight jump on to triangles and rectangles why why do we limit our horizon why do we limit the universe of mathematics in such a completely irrelevant manner that we don't look at uh, how mathematics is playing out around us and uh, so we of course then went into drawing of bricks and for the first time looking at faces what does a face mean uh, you know how many faces does it have and uh, then looking at how walls are actually constructed you know how do you give strength to the wall so uh, do you just place it like munia has done or do you do it like zenab and why so asking real life questions about wall patterns and why is it that they are made this way and then uh, of course went into jharokhas and this is lori baker's uh, construction you know really eminent uh, architect so we are going into how architects look at construction and why are jharokhas made why are so arches what is the just bringing in art and architecture and a legacy of Uh, alternative architecture on brick architecture which this exists in kerala uh, so bringing all that in the chapter and uh, finally doing some exercises about bricks and then how bricks are made so going into a kiln looking at the brick and then asking him to sequence this because obviously even sequencing a process is a part of understanding is a part of mathematics how do you understand sequencing and then going into large numbers you know how many bricks do you think a truck carries we we did done a lot of that estimation estimation of large numbers how do you do it and how do you encourage that so this is just one chapter that i'm saying how you don't go into straight away without thinking in a thoughtless manner go into uh, shapes of triangle rectangle finished uh, cuboid do some measurements around that and then later on try and bring in applications no i think doing mathematics from life is really looking at life and then you know coming on to other more abstract ways of doing it and people often think that these books have a lot of stories i don't think it's true uh, they think that you know these are not mathematics these are just making it interesting i think even the word activity based or joyful have been trivialized we tend to trivialize these words because we think that uh, you know uh, in the indonesian textbook in the mathematics textbook my i'm trying to stop share and it gets hung it hangs here you are audible i'm audible okay yes. but i can't stop sharing my thing so anyway 
Uh, so I, I, in the mathematics textbook, which has been revised, uh, it says we are doing an activity. And what was the activity? There were four statements and the question was, which statement is different in this? You know, it meant nothing. Each of them was a different statement. So I'm just saying we trivialize sometimes this idea of what is activity based. We trivialize what is child centered. And uh, ultimately we don't do the more creative and more challenging uh, part of, of the same area, of the same uh, learning area, which can be done when we change the ways that we do it, or change the ways that we think how it should be done. And because uh, then it doesn't alienate people that much. If people feel that it's close to their life. And I think that's what we really need to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any, anybody from the audience would like to ask some question or comment on something? Uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. As one of the participants says that uh, she got a new perspective of teaching today. And I totally agree with that. Yes, uh, Ketki, do you want to ask something? Your hands are raised. Any questions from the audience? Uh, Ma'am, can you also talk about gender and mathematics? Means um, there is a lot of preconception that girls are bad at mathematics, and also um, means my parents, myself, they um, they encouraged me to take biology rather than mathematics uh, after I passed my tenth grade. So yeah, so means yeah. how does that come into our culture? In Indian culture. Yeah, that, that comes in uh, in most places all over the world. Like I said, this understanding that mathematics is only for some special talent, some special people, you know, that you have to have a talent for that. Uh, then, you know, again, this gendered understanding of what is maths, because you design it in a very abstract way and you design it in a way which is very distant, it hardly has any human agency. And so you tend to then marginalize women who might feel happier if there is collective activity. And that has been not just in maths in science and other things also. We, uh, we have found over the decades that when there are activities which are collective, which you do together, in which there's a lot of engaging, in which there is human agency, uh, uh, women feel, girls feel much more, uh, you know, they feel much more involved and they get engaged in that. And if it's something which is very competitive, uh, then it becomes more like, you know, the masculine sort of competitiveness comes in. And then you tend to tell girls that, sorry, you know, you're not really made for this after all, what are you going to use this for? So that kind of gendering comes in many different ways. And mathematics and science become two things, especially mathematics, because it's science still has something that, to do with, the, with nature, with the world around you, with leaves, with... And biology becomes again the area which women take up much more. Uh, but mathematics doesn't have any such thing. There's hardly anything which engages you with the real world or with humans involvement. And that is what we need to bring in. And that's why if you see in the textbook that we worked on, women are major protagonists. You know, there's a whole chapter on a woman junk, junk seller, which is a true chapter. She's, she has this shop in Patna. And uh, so how do you bring in women's agency and uh, participation, ways of looking, ways of thinking uh, into it so that it becomes more inclusive. It's not just women, but actually it's like the feminine and the masculine ways if you want to have these very broad definitions, but there's a gendering that happens within disciplines and within certain areas of that discipline, which is tied to uh, more abstraction and more competitive ways of engaging in it. Yeah. Uh, Aishwarya, you want to ask something? Um, a very good evening, uh, Anita, ma'am. I have heard you in different platforms and uh, was looking forward to this session from you today. Uh, the reason being that um, I am a very new teacher and uh, I have worked with school leaders across budget private schools in Hyderabad. And when you say that the matter is very the, math, the matter of maths is taken very trivially in schools. 
I agree to it because schools have targets to reach, admissions to get, and to show results to parents. Uh, but I have had uh, leaders in the past who have asked this question that if we want to make it um, understanding based for students, there are very less resources that is available for them to refer to if they want to start uh, looking at mathematics seriously from life. So uh, I think, I don't know if this is the right platform to ask you over here, but uh, could you guide us to any of the resource, uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, I think not someone who has been an expert and uh, have that education to understand what really mathematics mean, could go back and refer to if they really want to start looking at maths uh, from life for the school learning purpose, starting from pre-primary to an elementary level, if there is anything that we could refer to. Uh, if not a material, uh, if you could give a perspective on how we can look at the, uh, on the existing curriculum uh, to be more of learner-centric and uh, create that uh, learning in students. Uh, yes, can I just, you know, uh, I can't see you, so I just want to take a second. I want to, um, you know, reconnect. Okay, I just reconnect. Okay, now I can see you. Yeah. So uh, yes, uh, you know what, I should. I wanted to tell you that. There was an interesting experience I had just a couple of months back. Um, they were engineering colleges and universities of uh, in Maharashtra who wanted to talk about assessment. And I was the person who was giving me a vote of thanks. She was the head of the IT department of uh, Somaya University. And uh, she suddenly told me that you wouldn't know, but uh, you have actually really encouraged me to do mathematics, not just in school, but right through college. And now I'm, an, I'm a teacher, my, my PhD is done and I'm a teacher in the engineering college. So I said, how? She said uh, her teacher had given her this book called Zindagi Ka Hisab. And I was just amazed, you know, I mean, I'm talking to engineering faculty and deans and everyone. And suddenly this person says that she had given up on mathematics and her teacher had brought this book, Zindagi Ka Hisab, which we had written actually for adult learners. You know, I mean, we were doing the literacy campaign and we were working with out of school uh, youth. And we had written this book, Zindagi Ka Hisab, which uh, is an enlarged version. The English version is uh, numeracy counts. And you'll find them, uh, Arvind Gupta has digitized them and they are on the internet. They're available freely. So she said she found this and she has kept that book with her. And she, she tells me that she lost hope in class 10. Then again, she read through the book. I don't know how, it was never meant for a class 10 child. And then she said that she has, uh, even after class 12, it has given her hope. And you know, in that session, while she's giving me a vote of thanks, she's narrating examples from the book. So for me, it was like the biggest reward of my life that I've written something for uh, you know non-literates in a literacy campaign and here there's someone telling me that she's gone on to do her PhD and she felt motivated by that. So look at that book, you'll find examples, you'll find a lot of things, resources from other places. And uh, then when you search for other resources, I think you'll get an idea of how do we engage with, uh, you know, how do we bring life into the mathematics or mathematics into our everyday lives yeah yeah thank you thank I you ma'am for that yeah please uh, since we have run out of time uh, i would like to come to the closure of this session and we can go on and on in fact we have got in abundance ma'am from you today uh, be it mathematics education be it looking at the policy and if I go to highlight those points, I may not do justice to the session that you have actually provided insights. You spoke about politics of mathematics education that is manufacturing the crisis. You have also talked about mathematics for life, from life, for equity, and ample examples you have given. In fact, if I look, if I try to retrospect and look at the way, the flow of your session, I need to go back to the recording and see really it has given a lot of valuable insights uh, we need to hear more from you we need to listen more to you 
and i think this one hour is not enough i'm sure participants will agree with that but today thank you so much on behalf of our center of education excellence in teacher education i take this privilege to thank you for sparing your valuable time coming here sharing your expertise and you know sharing lot of examples i'm sure we will look forward to many more sessions on this mathematics education itself and you have taught us to read between the nep and try to critically look at the aspects of nep and definitely we will go back and do that um, thank you so much for coming here and thank you participants for joining us today in vartalap the discussion series and we will come soon with another in a month's time and we'll keep you informed about that uh ma'am there are people who are not from mathematics domain and still have uh, gained a lot of insights from our session i'm very happy and i look forward to meeting you wherever you are whenever possible absolutely ma'am please when you are in mumbai please do let me know we will definitely have a meeting yeah. thank you so much thank you bye yeah. bye thanks thanks